Hello, everybody. My name is Roberta Watson. I'm the Associate Director of the Alumni Affinity Programs here at USC in the Alumni Association. I have the privilege of welcoming you to our first time homebuyers workshop during Financial Literacy Month and the Career Centers Conference this week. Thanks so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you online for this evening's workshop led by our wonderful partners at American Pacific Mortgage. And we'll have Jason Mata sharing his expertise, answering questions, and just giving us a better understanding of what it takes to purchase your own home. A little bit of housekeeping before I pass it over to Jason. Um, we will be taking questions throughout the evening and answering those both in written form and live. So make sure you use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. You can type that and we'll get those answered as soon as we can. Um, and we are recording tonight's session, so we will provide a link to the recording after the event tomorrow or Friday. We'll get it out this week and Jason's slides too, but that's all the housekeeping. I'm gonna pass it over to Jason. Awesome. Thanks, Roberta. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. It's always um, just fantastic to get a chance to connect with our USC alum and you know get a chance to be able to present this content. So um, welcome uh, to our class tonight. My name, my name is Jason Maida again. Uh, really excited to be with you. This is our first class for 2024, and it's a great kickoff into Financial Literacy Month uh, to talk a little bit about home buying. So really helping you and supporting you with resources for what probably is going to be the largest purchase you decide to make in your upcoming financial future. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be able to present this content to you. Um, and, you know, as we go through tonight's presentation, we encourage you ask questions. Roberta mentioned earlier, you know, use the Q and a function. I'll do my best to answer those questions as I roll through tonight's uh, slideshow. We are recording tonight's event, as you heard earlier, and then all of our presentation material, we're going to get a chance to send back out to you uh, over the next couple of days. Okay. So thanks again for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you have probably some other things you could do on a Wednesday night, but hopefully you'll get some real good, uh, solid information from tonight's class. You know, we've been in partnership with the USC alum for, gosh, we're going on probably four or five years. Um, it's probably one of my favorite partnerships to be a part of because I get a chance to be able to educate the future home buyers across our country. And so it's it's really a joy to be here with this you this evening. So a little bit about me. I work for an organization called American Pacific Mortgage. We're a California-based mortgage company, but I serve in education for home ownership all across the country. So whether you're on the East Coast, South, Midwest, you know, in the mountains or up uh, on the West Coast, we can help support you in home ownership. So we have an educational platform like this to help support you with resources on that path towards home ownership. So we basically teach classes like this, usually once to twice a week through different partnerships to help with those educational tools. So a little bit about tonight's class. So this is an interactive uh, class. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have some talking points that you see on screen where we're gonna kind of spend some time looking at budgeting for home ownership, what the housing market looks like. We'll spend some time looking at interest rates and what's kind of fueling the interest rate environment. We'll talk a little bit about credit. I want to give you some tips and some resources around credit to help you. Um, we're also going to look at student loans. So if you know, you know, as new graduates or maybe you're kind of you know, still getting your financial footing, what does student loans do to your qualifying for mortgage? We'll talk about loan programs that exist for home buyers documentation that we need to gather if we're thinking about looking at a home buying plan for home ownership. We'll talk a little bit about assistance programs. So I know majority of us, of us are here in California, but whether you're in California or outside of California, there are resources to help you as first time home buyers. Then I also want to take a look at the process with you this evening. So after tonight's class, you may say, hey, you know what? I want to kind of get connected and talk a little bit more about my finances and what that looks like in aligning for home ownership. Well, we're going to take you through that process of what that'll look like for you. Okay. All right. So let's let's go ahead and get get started now. So we're going to first talk about what home buying you know means really, or does it make sense for me as a future first time home buyers? So I think I first need to think a little bit about what the benefits come along with owning a home. So if I'm currently renting right now, I could probably expect my rent to go up each year as I you know, renew my lease. Well, one of the benefits of having home ownership is I'm controlling my destiny from a budgetary perspective, right? So I have a locked in payment, hopefully over the next 30 years. This is an asset that will hopefully grow over time. So that home appreciates 
as that home appreciates, that creates wealth for me in my household. Now, as my home goes up in value, the differences in between um, balances versus your um, your kind of your uh, what's what's the the perceived value of the home is equity. Okay, and and sorry, I wasn't screen sharing, so let me uh, screen share what we have going on. Um, but yeah, so so that difference is is home equity. And there still is some tax benefits that come along with owning a home. So, you know, when we think about ownership and we compare our budgets versus renting versus buying, um, it's not really truly an apples to apples comparison because we have to think about all the benefits that go into owning versus what it could look like with renting. Um, so so that's kind of what we want to think about when we look at this buying makes sense. Now I want to kind of launch into like a budgeting exercise for us to kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, what could this look like if I decided to look at home ownership versus versus kind of continue to go down the path of renting. So here's kind of a budgeting tool that we're gonna we're gonna take a look at. And sorry, I wasn't sharing my screen earlier. I think we kind of got going and and, and forgot to share some of the slides. But um, again, we're gonna share all this material back with you in the next couple of days. So you didn't miss really anything um, other than our talking points for tonight, and we'll we'll kind of run through those. This is a budgeting tool that comes to us from Freddie Mac. And what we're going to be able to do with this tool is to be able to compare renting versus buying. So we've kind of put a what if scenario here, but in our deck page for tonight's presentation, all the links for this calculator will be available to you. So let's kind of take a look at it. So if we were to think about you know, our current rent situation, let's say hypothetically, I'm paying $27.50 a rent. And let's say I have renter's insurance of $20 a month. And then I have an expected rent increase of 5% on an annualized basis. So that's gonna be our kind of our rent equation, right? Now we're gonna add in a few data points from our uh, ownership perspective. So let's say I purchase a home for 700,000. You're gonna learn a little bit more about loan programs in just a second, but the minimum down payment to purchase a home today is 3% for first time home buyers on a purchase price of 700,000. We have estimated property taxes. Generally, we're gonna factor in 1.25% of our purchase price for uh, property taxes. We have homeowner's insurance, we have estimated maintenance costs, and then we wanna add in loan information. So you're gonna learn more about loan information in just a second, a second during our product segment, but generally speaking, as first time buyers, we're gonna elect a 30 year fixed mortgage option. We have an average interest rate of six and a half percent. We have origination charges. When we think about origination charges, those are gonna be costs that lenders will charge you for your financing. Um, now, in our partnership with USC alum, you actually get discounted origination charges. We'll talk more about that later, but ultimately you get a $750 discount in our services along with just um, the ability to be able to access uh, potentially lower interest rate option products. And then discount points are where you as a consumer decide to bring down your interest rate by paying additional money out of pocket to bring, that, bring down that interest rate Usually one discount point is the equivalent of 1% of my loan amount. So here's what that mean, means. So if I'm going to finance, let's say $600,000 for my mortgage, right? And I'm going to pay one point in cost, that's $6,000. Now that $6,000 should equate to about a quarter percent reduction in interest rate for my mortgage, okay? Now in today's market, the break-even point on that investment is about two to three years, so for a lot of our buyers buying in today's market, they're probably, if they're purchasing in 2024, maybe considering refinancing in 25 or 26. And so the reason why I highlight that for our audience tonight is because those that are buying today, it doesn't really necessarily make a lot of sense to buy points because you're probably going to be looking at refinancing over the next two to three years. So there doesn't really make sense from a break-even perspective. And then we have other services that we always also want to factor into the equation those are part of the overall closing cost to buy a home. When we think about savings for a home, we have our down payment, which we're going to talk about more in tonight's class. And there's also closing costs. Closing costs can generally be about 2 to 3% of your overall purchase price. So that's the total transaction cost. And then we also want to look at the last section, which is other assumptions. So we're going to assume that our house will go up in value about 4% on an annualized basis. We have expected years of seven years in the home. We have now the cost of selling our house, because what we're going to do in this analysis is say that we're going to sell our home seven years from now and then compare that versus renting. All right. And then we have state and federal tax rate as well as the savings rate currently. Right. So so if we look at this 
side-by-side -side comparison. So from a payment perspective, we're going to definitely go up, right? So our rent's $2,700 a month. Our mortgage payments can inc increase to about $5,800 a month. So that's a, that's a pretty swift increase, right? However, if we were to kind of put this, stack this up side-by-side -side of buying versus renting, we have about a $50,000 opportunity over the next seven years comparing renting versus buying. Now, I know that looks a little bit different for everyone in tonight's audience on, you know, in that equation, whether you're going to buy in Orange County or L.A. County, or maybe you're in the Midwest and the housing prices are a little bit less expensive or rent costs look different. We understand that, but hopefully you can use this calculator as a tool to kind of help prepare you from a budgetary perspective. All right, let's go ahead and kind of keep it moving a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about today's housing market from a national perspective. And then we're going to kind of zero in to look a little bit more at the Southern California markets, because I think most of us are in Southern California, but the markets don't look that different. And from a national perspective, the median home sales price is about just over $400,000. You can see prices inching up a little bit year over year, about a 6% increase across the country. That obviously varies by region that we're kind of speaking of. Now, what's kind of fueling a little bit of the increase right now is inventory levels. Um, there really isn't a lot of supply for buyers. So new home builders are trying to rush in to fill the gap of supply that's needed because believe it or not, even in a high 6% environment, still a lot of buyer demand out in the market. So we just don't have a lot of inventory to support the demand, which is basically pushing prices up. Um, now, this spring and summer, some of the indications we've seen from like Redfin, some of their early projections is saying that inventory levels will probably go up by about 10% this year, which is really encouraging news. The flip side of that is that there is indications, which we'll talk about in just a bit, that rates will probably decrease in June. Generally speaking, lower interest rates will fuel up higher prices of homes. So that's what we're seeing from a national perspective. Here's the LA housing market, very similar slightly higher increase in the LA market year over year in median sales price. Still same challenge exists in LA, not as much inventory, still relatively high demand. So still new home builders coming in to kind of kind of fill the gap. As you can imagine, LA, especially in kind of more of the metropolitan area, more densely populated, not as much opportunity for um, new home construction. So what's happening? We're seeing more building occurring on the outskirts. So as we go further east of LA County, you're seeing a lot more kind of building uh, of new home communities. You know, believe it or not, Palmdale, Lancaster, some of those areas, much more popular with some of our LA uh, first time buyers. And you're seeing people move out to Riverside and San Bernardino County. Some of that's because of, you know, just housing inventory opportunities. Also, it's because of what the cost of housing looks like in today's market. Okay. Now we talked a little bit about interest rates and, you know, where we're at today is much better than we were in October. So October 21st rates hit an 8% high. Um, I was telling the audience last night, I, I remember specifically where I was at. I was in Palm Springs the day we hit 8% rates. Probably wasn't a great day. Um, obviously, that really put a, a huge squeeze on affordability for first-time home buyers. And so that's where we kind of tipped out in interest rates. Now, re rates have come down dramatically since then. Today, we sit in a rate pattern right around 65 to 6.75%. Um, but we're still kind of riding in a relatively high level as it relates to historical levels of interest rates. So historical levels are right around five and a quarter to five and a half percent. So we're still a long ways away from that. Now, as we kind of push forward into 2024, early indications are that the Federal Reserve will cut interest rates at the June meeting. So we're all kind of hoping for that. I think last projections I saw was about a 70% chance of a cut in the Federal Reserve rates. So we're really looking forward to that because that'll obviously help create some relief from the mortgage interest rate perspective. Um, so we'll kind of be looking forward to that. At the same time, kind of where we're here today is because of what the Federal Reserve has done to kind of combat inflation in today's market. So we're all all feeling a little bit of the pinch of the high cost of goods, you know, of housing, of, of fuel, whatever it might be. And so certainly that's a reflection of the inflationary environment. But as we're seeing a little bit of cooling in inflation, that's going to hopefully get the Federal Reserve to help kind of come off of interest rates. And our expectation, again, is in June for us to realize that hopefully that decrease. Um, just as a quick side note, I see a lot of questions thrown up in the q and I'm going to try to get some, to some of those. Um, and we're going to talk about one of the questions I see in the chat, which is what factors um, will influence interest rates, whether they go up or down. Um, that, 
you know, first of all, that's going to be a, a market driven uh, change. So interest rates will will move according to what the market is doing. Now, we are truly a global economy, right? So something that happens in the U.S. may not necessarily move the rates one day as opposed to another, but maybe something happens in Germany. Um, they decide to you know, come off their interest rates or increase their their funds rate that could influence he us here in the U.S. or, you know, oil prices spike, whatever happens. But interest rates basically change by the minute. Now, when we look at from an interest rate perspective, there's different characteristics that go into the selection of an interest rate. So, you know, not every buyer is going to achieve the same level of interest rates. Credit eligibility plays a factor in that. The type of product that we're going to select will play a role in the interest rate. How much I decide to finance, what my down payment is. Uh, we talked a little bit about discount points earlier. So if I'm looking to buy more um, relief on an interest rate perspective and then pay more costs out of pocket, that can help me um, with interest rates. And then the term of my loan can also help lower my interest rate. Now, most first-time buyers are going to elect a 30-year fixed mortgage product. But if I decide to shorten that term to maybe a 20-year or maybe a 15-year term, that can also help bring down my interest rates. As we meet with you for a consultation, if you decide to take that next step at some point in time, you know we're going to sit down with you and kind of figure out what the right design is for you from a financing perspective. Okay. I'm going to answer this question because I, I think it's a popular one, which is, when is the right time to buy with regards to interest rates? Should we be timing the home, home buying market based upon the June Fed meeting? So great question. I think it's the question everybody wants, right? We all want the perfect storm of home buying. I want the lowest interest rate. I want the lowest prices. It's going to be tough to achieve that. I, I've never seen it happen in my career, um, you know, because when rates were two and a half percent, you know, prices were still spiking, right? Because you know, ultimately, lower interest rate environment will fuel higher prices, right? Um, and so we just have a very dynamic economy right now. And so it's really hard to time it. Um, if you're waiting for the June Fed meeting for interest rates to drop to kind of go forward in home, in home buying, that timing may work for you. But it's also probably working out for a lot of other buyers. So they're going to have higher demand. If we're only getting 10% relief from an inventory perspective, you are going to have high demand out there. Depending on the market we're looking in right now, we could see 10, 20, 30 offers on one home currently. Okay, great question from our group. Let's talk a little bit about credit because I think it's really important as we're building a home buying plan together and figuring out you know, interest rate or product options. Um, now, many of you are using credit monitoring tools like Credit Karma, or you're using some of the tools offered through the different agencies like Experian, TransUnion, Equifax. All those are great. Keep on using them. But typically what they're going to be using is a credit card model. Now, from a mortgage perspective, we're always going to be using the mortgage financing credit tool. And so I want to take you through the weighting of that. So if we can see on screen, 15% uh, of the weighting is going to be how long I've had credit. So the longer my credit file has been in existence, the better my credit score could be. And then 20% is going to be how much new credit am I trying to get access to, which those would be also known as inquiries of credit. Those would typically be hard inquiries. Now, one of the things in our process we start with is a soft inquiry because for our first time buyers, we don't know if they're going to purchase in two or three months or two, in th two or three years, right? So we want to make sure that they don't have any impact to their credit score. So we always start with a soft credit check. And then if they find a home that they love and they get an accepted offer, then we proceed with the hard inquiry. But there are rules in place for mortgage financing that states that if you have a hard inquiry done on day one, you have 30 days of time to apply with as many lenders as you want. And it's the equivalent of one credit inquiry impact to your score. OK, so that's the 20 percent component of the score. 30 percent is going to be how much do I have on my revolving utilization of credit? So simply put, we're looking at your credit limits versus your credit balances. So if I have ten thousand dollars in credit limits. $5,000 in balances, I'm probably at 50% utilization, right? So we want to try to manage that down to as low as 10% utilization, so $1,000 or less. Now, for those of, us, those of us that might be running a little bit higher in utilization, that's totally okay. You may be at 70 or 80% utilization, but if you're trying to really manage up your credit score, we'd encourage you to first start by getting utilization below 50% and then kind of work towards that 10% utilization number. Let me give you a quick tip on how to best manage utilization of, of credit. So if you have some time later tonight or tomorrow, take a look at one of your statements for your credit cards that you have, right? 
There's two dates that I want you to look at. There's the cycle date or statement date that's on the credit card. There's also the due date. Now, the statement or cycle date is the date at which the credit card issuer is going to report all of your account information to the agencies, right? Now, the due date is when you typically are going to pay your bill. However, the reporting of your account happens with that statement date. So if you're in the habit of paying on your due date, try to switch the practice and now pay down or pay off your credit card before the end of the statement date, because then you're going to allow yourself to get a much more improved credit score, especially if you're getting ready to apply for home financing or maybe even auto financing. That's going to allow you to get a much better credit score, hopefully improve the product or interest rate offering that you have. Okay. The last component or waiting to the credit score for mortgage is going to be payment history, right? That's going to be simply, how have I paid my bills? We're typically looking at events that have happened within the last 12 to 24 months if we've had some delinquencies of credit. Generally, the lates are reported as 30-day lates, 60-day lates, and 90-day delinquencies. So the further I get over to the, the late spectrum, the bigger impact I'm going to have to my credit score, especially if it's in the last 12 to 24 months on my uh, credit report. Now, things like big events like bankruptcy, short sales, collections, those are going to have a bigger impact to our credit score, right? Especially in that 12 to 20 more, 24 month window. From a lending perspective, we always look at all three bureaus and we, we all know the bureaus, they're Experian, Equifax, and there's TransUnion, but we take the middle score of all three of those agencies. So if I'm at a 740 is my best score, 720 is my middle score, 700 is my lowest score. From a qualifying perspective, I take the 720 credit score for eligibility. Now, that's important for us to understand because that 720 credit score is going to impact my interest rate, the product that I can elect, as well as mortgage insurance, if I'm going to put less than 20% down to purchase my home. Okay. Now, if I'm going to apply with my partner and my partner joins the, the, the application, Let's say my partner is now at 700 as the top score, 680 is the middle score, and 660 is the lowest score. The 60 score is what we use from a qualifying perspective. So that's really important to understand because if I if I do a joint application and my partner does have that lowest credit score, that will could change the product offering that we have or the interest rate selection that we have. The optimal level we would love to get to to help the best financing options would be 780 to 800 or higher. Last thing I want to point out in this screen is just around count closure. So we talked a little bit about length of credit, which is 15% of the waiting. When you decide to close out a credit account from a revolving perspective, if you do, what it does is it pulls away all the credit history from the, the, um, from the reporting. So I would really encourage you, be careful of doing that because there's two impacts. It's that, which is the, the seasoning of the account, but also you lose another line of credit for the utilization of credit. So just be careful there before you make any moves like doing balance transfers and closing out an old account. I would encourage you, especially if you're pretty new in credit, Try to keep active uh, credit cards out there. I know personally, I have cards that I've had for years. I don't really use them. I watch the annual fees, but you know, it doesn't. It allows me to keep that that history I've had with those relationships. All right. This is a matrix that you can use if you had some past challenges. You want to see, hey, you know, wonder how long are those going to stay on my credit report? This is kind of the the just a little tool to show you guys how long they'll be with you. Now, going back to my earlier point, the impact is within the last 12 to 24 months, but how long they'll stay in my reporting is relevant to what type of uh, credit event it is. Um, question in the chat was, do utility bills count as part of checking your payment history? So they do not, but I do want to kind of share something that would be helpful for you if you're new to credit. So a lot of clients we work with just don't have established credits um, because they just may be new to credit and they might not even have a credit score reporting. So one way you can boost your credit is through a tool through Experian called Experian Boost. Now, this isn't a pro promo promotion for Experian, but I will say they do have a tool that allows you to take like your utility bills, your rental payments, um, different things like that that are kind of offline payments and allow those to come onto your credit report. So if you're new to credit, you're trying to establish a credit score, that's one way to kind of boost your credit. Another way I'd recommend is if you don't have a credit card and maybe you're, you have a banking relationship, talk to your banking institution because generally they'll have kind of starter credit cards that you can use to help build your credit profile. All right, good question out there. 
And then, um, okay, let me, I'm going to kind of just grab, we have a lot of questions in the chat. So you guys are doing great. Ken's helping me with some of the chat, the the questions in the chat that I can't get to as part of our presentation. I would, I want to keep us on track as much as possible. Um, let's go ahead and, and, and kind of talk a little bit about student loans and I'll address a few questions in the Q and A. Um, so student loans can impact your eligibility for financing. We have to kind of take a look at those because ultimately those can have um, some consequence from just your total outgoing debts. Now, if you're currently in an active income-based repayment um, program right now, we can use that, that minimum payment from a qualifying perspective. So for example, if I'm at $75,000 in total aggregate student loan balances and my payment's $250 a month, now we can use that from a qualifying perspective for the mortgage. Now, if I'm in grad school right now and I'm in a deferment or I'm in forbearance, I still have to count a minimum payment from a qualifying perspective. So if I have that same amount of student loans on a conventional loan, I need 1% of the total balances and payments. From an FHA perspective, we would take 0.5% of the total balances for the monthly payment. So even though I may have deferment or forbearance, the takeaway is we still have to count a minimum payment. We'd encourage you to get connected with us to talk a little bit about that because that could impact the overall qualifying as the student loans. I do realize some of us have cancellation of student loan debt. That's awesome if you have that. Um, we just, we need to have the documentation and kind of figure out the timing of it because unless it's been reported to the credit bureaus, we then still have to currently kind of qualify with the active student loan payment. <clears throat> All right, let's let's talk a little bit about loan programs. And there's a variety of different programs that exist in the mortgage space. I want to spotlight tonight five of those programs for you in tonight's discussion. And let's first talk a little bit about conventional loans. Conventional loans, when we think about those loans, those are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac loans. Um, those are, are originated about 70% of all loans in the mortgage space. Now, as you saw earlier, the minimum credit score for the, the Fannie Mae or conventional loan um, product is a 620 credit score. So it's a minimum down payment of 3% up to the conforming limit, which is 766550. So that means I can finance our clients all the way up to 766550 with a 3% down payment. Now, if I'm in LA County today and I really want to buy a $900,000 house, I would have to put down a 5% down payment because LA County, no surprise, is considered a high cost of living community. So we can take that loan amount all the way up to 114829 However, the down payment moves from 3% to 5%, okay? So that's on the conventional product. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about a difference between conventional and FHA as it relates to mortgage insurance in just a second. But with conventional loans, when I put less than 20% down, I will have mortgage insurance for my home financing. And I'll walk you through some examples of that in just a minute. For FHA loans, those are going to be clients that are using a federally insured loan called FHA, stands for the Federal, Federal Housing Administration, minimum down payment of 3.5%, maximum loan amount can vary, and that varies just like the conventional product based upon where we are in the country. Now, FHA is not just a first-time buyer product. It can be used for second and third-time buyers. FHA is going to allow a little more leniency in guidelines as opposed to a conventional product. The credit scores are a little bit lower. It can go down to a 580 credit score. Um, so they're really going to allow buyers to have more flexibility in their eligibility. So if I had a late payment, let's say in a year or two years ago, maybe it was a 30-day or a 60-day delinquency, FHA would be okay with that. Whereas a conventional loan might be a little more difficult because um, they're looking for a little bit more of a cleaner payment history. Um, the VA product is an amazing loan uh, for our veterans that have eligibility. That's the VA home loan. Allows veterans to put no money down to purchase their home. You can go in excess of a million dollars in amount financed. Minimum credit score for the veteran is 620. With the VA product, it allows a lot more flexibility for the veteran. So we can encourage and help in home ownership. So if a veteran has had some past challenges during the pandemic and wasn't able to stay on track with bills, VA is going to allow a little more flexibility, or if the veteran has a little higher expenses versus income, the veteran product can have a little more flexibility there too as well. And then the last two products, um, one is the USDA product that allows us to buy in more rural areas. So let's say I really want to buy in Joshua Tree, right? I, I want to really live in the desert. Um, USDA will grant us 
financing options in those areas. There's two big requirements that come with the USDA product. One, the geography. So where do I buy? It has to be uh, located in a USDA designated area. And two is there's housing income requirements or restrictions, I should say, with the USDA product. And then there's the jumbo loan product. So if I need a little bit more financial support from a, you know, like a like kind of a loan financing perspective, I need a higher balance finance. There's the jumbo loan product. Um, we see that in some of our higher cost of living markets, not really typical for first time home buyers, but it usually requires a 10 to 15% down payment amount. Now there's two components um, to the jumbo loan. That I think it's really important to understand. There's higher credit score requirements, which is generally 680 or higher but it also has higher asset requirements because when we think about home ownership, we need to save for down payment, but we also need to save for closing costs. We'll talk more about that in just a bit, but I also need to add in additional assets for what we call as reserves and reserves are going to be additional funds that I have available to me in case something happened to me financially. Usually for a first time buyer using jumbo, it's the equivalent of 12 months of my monthly payment. So if I have $7,000, this is my monthly mortgage payment. 12 months times seven would be $84,000. That's the amount of assets that I would need to have left over after I've contributed my down payment and my closing costs. All right. You guys are keeping us busy in the, in the Q and a, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to check one question here in the, and cause it relates to credit really quick. And then we'll talk a little bit about PMI. So the question is, if you pay your credit card, maybe three or five days late, will that affect your credit score? So it depends on the credit card because you want to see if you have a grace period. Obviously, you want to pay on the due date, um, but ideally before the billing cycle date. Check with your credit card issuer because you want to make sure they don't report late. Theoretically, if you're only three or five days late, that should not report as late. Until you get to 30 days late, um, then that shouldn't have any impact to your credit score. But you want to avoid late charges. I would encourage you, if you can, do automatic payment deduction. It just takes one thing um, off your tape, off your plate that you have to worry about. Okay. So, but good question there. Let's talk a little bit about PMI. So PMI is private mortgage insurance and what PMI does, it's insurance that protects the lender against default by the buyer. So if you were to have a struggle in your, in your payments, and unfortunately you couldn't make your mortgage mortgage payment and you became in default, the lender would be protected. Now there's different forms of mortgage insurance. And that's what I want to explain to our audience tonight so let's first talk about the conventional product. There's different payment options for the conventional MI. So there's ways that you can pay it monthly, which is like 95% of the transactions. There's split MI where I pay some of it monthly, some of it upfront. There's single premium where I completely buy out the mortgage insurance. And then there's lender paid mortgage insurance, which really isn't common in today's market. That's where you elevate the interest rate and use the margin of that interest rate to buy out the mortgage insurance altogether. Now, with PMI, there's characteristics that go into the premium, and that is the, the, the how much I'm financing, what my credit score is, and how much my down payment is will all fluent influence what my PMI ultimately results in. So if some of you in tonight's class have started some of your home search already, and that's awesome because that might have brought you to tonight's class, if you're on sites like Redfin or Zillow and use their calculators, they're probably not going to be very accurate because a lot of those calculators are not going to use kind of the, the metrics here that we have to what actually MI is. Think about private mortgage insurance on a conventional loan, loan is like uh, like auto insurance, right? If I have a really fancy car, if I drive a lot, um, if I'm in like a high traffic area, I'm probably going to have more expensive auto insurance versus, you know, if I, I have more of a kind of a more of an economy car low driving record, that kind of stuff. I'm going to have lower cost of insurance. PMI works the exact same way. So the higher my credit score is, more my down payment is, the cheaper my PMI is probably going to be. So if we look at a PMI example at the bottom of our screen, so we have a $700,000 amount financed. We have a 740 credit score and a 3% down payment. That PMI is about 209 per month. Okay. So that will change based upon my credit score and my down payment. And of course, how much I decide to finance. Now, from an FHA perspective, it's going to look a little bit different because with FHA, with that flexibility and underwriting, lower credit scores can at times create higher risk for lenders. So there are two forms of government insured mortgage insurance. So one is there's upfront mortgage insurance, which is 1.75% of my loan amount. There's monthly mortgage insurance, which is 0.55% of my amount financed. And then that all gets factored into the financing. Now, 
With FHA mortgage insurance, there is not a cancellation option. Um, only on conventional loans can you have a cancellation option, which is when I have two years in my home and 22% equity, I can apply to have the mortgage insurance completely canceled. The only way to exit FHA mortgage insurance is basically to refinance into a conventional loan product. Now, here's an example of the FHA PMI you can see on screen. So if I kind of compare the conventional loan versus the FHA loan, I have that same $700,000 loan amount. Now I have to add on the upfront mortgage insurance of, in this case, $12,250, and then the monthly mortgage insurance of $320.80. So clearly there's a lot big difference from an expense perspective, but I, I would probably just go back to my earlier comment when we talked about products. FHA is going to give a lot more flexibility in the guidelines as the conventional, but it really depends on what the right product is for our clients. One thing that I heard um, in meeting with a client earlier today was, you know, if you do online searches, you may get interest rates that look lower on an FHA loan versus a conventional loan. And that is true. But what I encourage this buyer earlier today is to walk them through the calculation of mortgage insurance, because that is the true difference. And when you stack up side by side a payment on an FHA loan, versus a conventional loan. Generally, the conventional loan will be a little bit lower, especially for our high credit score customers. For our high credit score customers, we really should be looking at more of the conventional loan product. All right, um, let me just, okay. So it looks like we're, we're taking care of some questions. Um, all right, all right. You guys are doing great. I appreciate it. And we're trying to get to those as much as, uh, we can't, and, and, uh, and of course, keeping us on time. Let's talk a little bit about documentation for the home buying process. So after tonight's class, you may think, hey, you know what? I think I want to learn a little bit more about my own plan for home ownership. Well, there's some documentation that we would generally want to gather in this process. So I want to walk you through what that looks like. Generally, we need last two years of taxes, two years of W-2s, and 30 to 60 days of pay stubs along with proof of, proof of our asset statements. So those are gonna be like checking and savings account statements, maybe even a 401k or 403b if you're gonna introduce retirement as part of your savings um, for your down payment and or closing costs. One thing I like to talk about is around employment, especially for our young alumni that are considering home ownership. Cause you know, some of us in tonight's class might be new in our careers. We might not have two years on our job and that's completely okay from a financing perspective, because there is a rule in financing where we need to establish two years of work history and or education. So if I graduated from SC in the fall and now I just started my new job in 2024, that's totally okay. As long as I can put together four years of education and or work history, that meets the uh, require requirements for financing. Even in some cases where I've switched jobs, so maybe I was at my previous employment for one year and now I'm at a new employer, I can still use that in my work history to push together or put together, I should say, two years of work history. So that's completely allowed. In some cases, we'll have clients that are looking to apply for a mortgage and they're using their offer letter as earnings to be able to qualify for a mortgage. In fact, we have a, a professor that's moving out here to teach in, in uh, at UOP this year, and we're using his offer letter to qualify for a mortgage, even though he's still in Colorado. So that's an example where we can help people qualify for financing, even if they haven't started their first jobs. All right. Now, where the two year rule gets a little bit more difficult is if I have dual employment. So let me give an example. If I'm in healthcare and I work 30 hours at one clinic, 20 hours at another, I do have to show that I've been on both jobs two years in order to use both sources of income from a qualifying perspective. Now, if I'm a 1099 um, independent contractor or I have my own in, own business, that's where the two-year requirement is really kind of a definitive line here. You do have to have your business for at least two years in order to use that income for qualifying purposes. All right. And then the last thing I want to just kind of spotlight here from a documentation perspective is that if we have other sources of income, like let's say we have a partner that contributes to our household income unless our partner or spouse is gonna be part of the application, we can't use that income for qualifying purposes. I may rent out a room or anything like that, even though I have those kind of supplemental sources of income, those can't be used unless you know that person is gonna be part of the application. Now, one of the metrics we use for qualifying purposes is called debt to income ratio. It's a really simple calculation. It takes into consideration your gross monthly income versus your monthly expenses. and as a lender, that ratio can be anywhere between 45 to as high as 50%, believe it or not. Now, I know for those of you that are currently, you know, 
working as W-2 employees. When you get your paycheck on Friday, you're not taking home your gross pay, right? So it's probably your net pay after all the different taxes and deductions and whatnot, right? So this calculation is 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 quite aggressive. Um, so it's really important for us to get connected with you to talk about affordability because even though you know this ratio may say, hey, you're eligible for financing, we still want to talk through a really good budget with you to make sure that you're buying in a situation that's sustainable for you and of course affordable over over a long period of time. Here's what the ratio looks like. So we're taking into consideration principal and interest, taxes and insurance for the new house. If I'm putting less than less than 20% down, PMI, private mortgage insurance. If I'm buying a condo, maybe an HO, um, HOA might be uh, involved. Um, and then, I, so let's assume that payment is $3,100 a month. And then my other debts are, let's say $500 a month, right? If I take that divided by my, my gross monthly income of let's say $10,000 a month, then I'm at a 36% debt to income ratio. Now for most of our first time buyers, they feel like the comfort zone is 33 to 36%. But at the same time, we do have other buyers that feel okay at 45 or 46%. It's really kind of a conversation that we're going to have with you just to figure out what the right affordable level is for you in home ownership. All right, so our, our last topic before we kind of move into the process is going to be around savings and assets for home purchase. So as we learned earlier, there's kind of two components to savings for home buying. There's one is saving up for our down payment, which we learned is about 3% of our sales price at the minimum. But we also need to save for closing costs. Those things like title and escrow fees, lender fees, government charges, those can add up to an estimated 2 to 3% of our sales price for our home purchase. We're going to talk about assistance programs in just a, a bit for our first-time buyers, which we award to our classes. But let's talk a little bit about the documentation that we generally need. So as a lender, we're always going to verify the last 60 days worth of assets. Those can be in checking and savings accounts. Retirement accounts can potentially be used. We'd encourage you to talk to your tax or financial advisor before you get into those assets. And then gift funds can be potentially used too. So that's where a family member is helping support you in home ownership. Those assets don't require any type of seasoning, but any assets that I'm contributing have to be a seasoned at least 60 days. Now, there's usually two challenges to home ownership for our first time buyers. It could be credit because maybe I'm a little overextended right now, or maybe I've had some past challenges, but truly assets and savings are really kind of the other big challenges, especially for our new first time buyers. So there are first time buyer programs all across the country that can help support low to moderate income buyers. So whether you're in the Midwest or you're on the East Coast, there are programs through agencies like, they're called housing finance agencies. I'm in a spot like Cal HFA right now because a majority of our class is in California, um, but there are similar products across the country. So I would encourage you, you know, get connected with us. We, if you're, you know, you're joining us outside of California, we can certainly talk about those for you. So let's let's kind of share with you what Cal HFA is. So California, uh, Cal HFA stands for the California Housing Finance Agency. It's right here in Sacramento. It's designed to support low to moderate income housing buyers. Now, if you guys are kind of tuned into the news recently, KTLA, some of our other news outlets in Southern California, one program has really been spotlighted for Cal HFA um, over the last few weeks. That is the California Dream for All Shared Appreciation Loan Program. Um, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Before I get to that, do I, there are a, a variety of different programs offered through Cal HFA. Um, the My Home product is one of the products we do a lot of across the state. Provides a first-time buyer the support of covering the down payment of 3% for a conventional loan or 3.5% for an FHA loan. What the state is providing there with you is a 1% simple interest rate loan that does not get repaid <clears throat> until you sell your home or if you decide to refinance in the future. There's other programs like the Zip Assistance that can also support you with closing cost assistance. However, the Zip Assistance program doesn't really kind of make a lot of sense right now because of the high interest rate environment because it really elevates the interest rate. Cal HFA products not only provide support and resources, but the interest rates tend to be about a quarter percent below the market rate that's offered on a conventional or an FHA loan. Now, the Dream for All program, as I just mentioned, was kind of spotlighted on some news outlets you've probably seen on social channels. We've done a lot of kind of um, kind of awareness and education on this program. What it does is it provides up to 20% of your sales price in assistance or $150,000. The um, kind of key component with this program is you must be a first generational buyer, which basically means that you haven't owned a home in the last seven years and that your parents are not currently homeowners in the U.S. 
This is also a lottery-based program. So just today, April 3rd, the registration for this program opened up and it runs from April 3rd until April 29th. The lottery results will be coming out in early to mid-May. Um, we are the leading provider of Cal HFA programs across the state. So we provide most uh, first-time buyer programs in, of any lender across the state. Um, if you're interested in the Dream for All program, because you might've heard about that, get connected with us. Um, there's still time to get qualified for that program. Even though the registration just started, uh, there's there's prerequisites that come along with that program. You have to be pre-approved with an, an approved lender like us. And there's some educational requirements, which we can talk about a little bit more later. This is an example of kind of just a quick scenario so you guys can get kind of a visual of what it would look like for home buying traditionally with no assistance. So if I bought a $700,000 home, I had a 3% down payment, my closing costs, I'm probably going to need about $35,000 to $42,000 out of pocket, right? So for some of our first-time buyers, no big deal. But for some of us, it might be a little bit more out of reach, and we have to plan two, maybe three years out for that. However, with an assistance program, it could be a more of a near-term goal. Maybe it's a three- to six-month goal or a one-year goal, right? So that my home assistance can help support you from a down payment perspective, maybe supplement that side of it. So then I, maybe I only have to worry about my closing costs out of pocket. So a lot of great tools offered to you as first-time buyers. Now, there are eligibility requirements. There's minimum credit scores for the program, maximum debt-to-income ratios. Um, but most of the income requirements on first-time buyer programs around the state are very, very flexible and lenient. Most of our programs go up to 150% of the median income. Um, so like, for example, in LA County, we go up to $192,000. Orange County, it's upwards of $230,000. By the way, that's on the My Home Assistance Program. These products can be used for one-unit properties like single-family homes, condos, townhouses, um, even manufactured homes that that fits your budget. Here's the income limits for these programs. So you can see the My Home Assistance on the left side of screen. We have the California Dream for All program on the right. Okay. Now, one of the one of the interesting things with Cal HFA is we don't use household income in qualifying on these products. We only use applicant income. So if we were to kind of backtrack a little bit, let me just give you an example. On the Dream for All program, if that's something that's piquing your interest, if I have um, in combined income with my, my partner, let's say is 200,000, right? Let's say I make 120,000, my, my partner makes 80,000. Well, together we make too much for the Dream for All program. However, if we use just my income, we're within the income limits, and then we could potentially, potentially participate in the program. Now, I would be the only one applying for the mortgage and eligibility. So if I can buy the home that really works for us, then we could still participate in a first-time buyer program like that. So I'm going to answer a quick question, then we're going to talk about loan process, uh, which I think is, you know, is an interesting question, um, and I think it's really important to understand this. So the question was, how much does age impact the first-time buyers that are that are working with you, um, if um, in any form? So um, so meaning, if if you know if you're if you're a first-time buyer, is there any age like is that going to impact you at all? And it really it, it it doesn't. I mean, we you know I think you know those are getting it started in their in their finances now, great. Um, and we're here to help support you. We have first time buyers that are, you know, just newly out of college. We have first time buyers that are in their, you know, 60s and 70s as their first home. But it's the opportunity to be able to participate in home ownership. So everybody's at different cycles of life of of home ownership. And you know, knowing that you have resources and support to help you, I think is really the key ingredient. Um, one thing I want to just kind of just spotlight too, because I think one there's a misconception out there too when you apply for a mortgage. Um, that your relationship status does impact uh, home ownership. So whether you're in a domestic partnership, partnership, you're you're married, whatever the case may be, um, you can apply together in financing. It doesn't change your eligibility one way or the other. You can apply as a single individual. So I get a lot of that in my questions and working with clients. So um, just something you just, just I want to kind of share with you um, that has no impact for you on your eligibility. Um, let's talk a little bit about... Um, or the process of buying a house, okay? And I think, you know, it's a really important to kind of understand the milestones that you go through in purchasing a home. This is our six steps of home buying. And after leaving tonight's class, you may kind of want to get, get connected with us just to go through a consultation and design a home buying plan for you. Now, the output of that consultation is to start on this path towards home ownership, which would include having a pre-approval for you that allows you to have some kind of a certificate that shows that you're eligible for financing. Now that pre-approval is good for 60 days, 
but it can be easily recertified at any time for you. So a lot of our first time buyers are looking to buy over the next year or two, right? And that's totally okay to get connected with us for a consultation because we want to kind of be a strategic partner on this path towards home ownership for you. So it doesn't be, have to be something where you're looking to buy this weekend, right? It could be the end of this year, next year, 2026, whatever the, the goal might look for look like for you. But that pre-approval is kind of going to give you some framework for your financing. Step two is going to be my house search. So my house hunting for my home buying. Um, usually that home buying is probably going to take the longest cycle for you in this process. Could be two or three weeks, could be two or three years. We would encourage you to get connected with a realtor that's probably an expert in their community to be able to help show you what options exist for you. Um, now, as you go through your home search, there's different scenarios that we're going to run for you, and we'll kind of be able to amend your pre-approval based upon what you're finding in your search. Now, if you decide to make an offer on a home, that offer gets accepted, then that starts what we call the escrow process. And generally, the escrow process is 30 days. So from the time my offer gets accepted to the time I get my keys, it takes about 30 days. Now, it can be more condensed. We have what we call the quick close program. It can be as short as 14 days. That's a tool that we have for some of our more competitive markets um, to be able to help support first-time buyers. Now, once your offer is accepted, you'll get a call from me congratulating you on your offer acceptance and then kind of lay out for you what's going to happen next, which would include scheduling a follow-up consultation for you um, to be able to um, go through all of your financing, make sure you understand your interest rate options, your payment, your out-of-pocket expense, all of that. Within two to three days of your accepted offer, you, be, you will be required to make what we call an earnest money deposit, which is one to 2% of your sales price. And then that kind of kickstarts the process. Inspections get ordered, your appraisal is ordered for your house. And within 72 hours of your, um, your accepted offer, you, you basically get disclosures for all of your financing. Those are things that we review during your follow-up consultation. Um, now, the earnest money deposit, as I mentioned, usually takes place in the first two to three days of your contract. That is usually one to 2% of your purchase price. Those funds will count towards your total out-of-pocket expense. The earnest money deposit can vary in some markets in LA or the Bay Area can be as high as 3%. So, you know, we would encourage you to talk to a realtor about that. Um, now, in California, there are contingencies that protect the buyer um, during their contract period. So what that means is with, generally within the first 14 to 17 days, you have kind of a period to do your homework or your due diligence on the property to make sure it's a good fit for you financially, making sure the house is worth what you're going to pay for it, right. get your house inspected from an inspector, and then get your loan approved. So we want to make sure that you it's a good sound investment for you in that period of time. So your deposit is completely protected while you're in that contingency period. Now, step four is going to be the administrative tasks of your loan, verifying your employment, uh, verifying your assets, making sure everything is all kind of in, in position. We'll probably have your interest rate locked by that time. And then we submit everything to an underwriter. That takes us to step five, where we issue a loan approval for you. That also gets us about three quarters of the way through the process. Um, at that time, you'll be signing off on your contingencies. So if you've kind of done your inspections, your appraisal is good, your loan approval checks out, then we would recommend signing off on those contingencies. That tells the seller that you're ready to move to the final stages of the escrow process. Um, we're also going to deliver to you at that time a closing disclosure that starts a three-day cooling off period before you can physically sign documents with a public notary. In the home buying process, everything is done e-signature, but at the very end, it's still kind of an old school process. We have to sign documents in person with a notary. That takes about an hour. On that same day, you'll be delivering your final funds for closing to buy your house. And then once that's completed, we'll wire in the funds for your mortgage and any type of assistance programs that you're electing. And then documents get recorded with a county recorder's office. And that transpires to basically transfer the ownership from the seller to you, as well as to record the deed for the house. And once that's all confirmed, then we get a chance to make our favorite call of the day, which is basically to tell you you're now the official owner of the home. So that's kind of what the process looks like. It's a journey, right? It starts with kind of just educating yourselves, getting pre-approved, and then moving through the closing process. But it is one of the most rewarding and fulfilling things that you do financially for yourself, right? And of course, we want to be a partner with you on that journey. That day that I get a chance to make that call to our our new buyers is probably the best day I you know I have right I got a chance to make a few of those every day so that's that's a really cool opportunity. So as we're kind of getting to the close of tonight's class, 
If you're thinking about moving forward and learning more about home buying for, for yourself, we would encourage you to get connected with us for a consultation. That's a th free 30 minute service we provide for our USC alum. Um, and for all of our clients that we serve across the country, what it entails is completing an online application. We do a soft credit check, so you don't have to worry about your score being impacted. You then upload proof of income and assets, and then you schedule some time with us. That is a meeting one-on-one -on -one with me for a video session. Um, and what we're trying to do is just be a partner for you and kind of thinking through home ownership. Now, if you do have some questions after tonight's class and they didn't get answered in tonight's Q&A, which we'll have some time in just a bit, um, we'd encourage you to just set up an introductory call with us. Maybe it's a question around interest rates or maybe a credit scenario or maybe a loan scenario in general. We'd love to be able to connect with you for that. Here's what a consultation looks like. Again, it's a free service. Um, we're not expecting anything other than just to help support you. But we look at where we're going to buy, what's your budget need to be. We'll help you around with credit, look at some of the documentation you need. And then we'll kind of come out of that meeting having a concise plan with clear goals and objectives for home ownership and to possibly have you pre-approved. And then as we're kind of wrapping up, I want to share with you some other resources that we have, like our mobile app. So if you're thinking about starting the process, you can do it all by mobile. Um, you can do calculations via, via the mobile tool and kind of follow the progress or chart your progress with home buying all via mobile. Of course, it's available from Apple or through Apple and Android. Our discount that I mentioned earlier for you is available exclusively for our USC alum. It allows us to reduce our cost by $750 for your home financing whenever you decide to take those next steps. And finally, here's all my contact information. So we'd encourage you to get connected with me. Feel free to send me a message or if you want to get connected with me for a consultation, here's all my contact information. And we do have a dedicated landing page for our USC alum. It's at gotrojansmortgage.com. You can see a full list of our services and discounts and to schedule a consultation with us right there on the site. And all of tonight's class, as I mentioned, is going to be recorded. Well, we're recording right now. It's going to be up and available for you tomorrow on our YouTube channel. We'll also be getting the deck page out to you with all the presentation material. Um, and so as we come to a close, I would encourage you, get connected with us socially too. We have a lot of great content we try to put on our socials. Um, all of our classes that we teach not only go up on our, on our YouTube channel, but other classes like things like the Dream for All program are up on our YouTube channel right now you know, kind of Q&A sessions that I do throughout the year because um, we want to really, and we're really passionate about educating our communities in home ownership, including, of course, our USC alum. So with that said, I want to go and kind of move us into a QA. and a I know we're over the top of the hour. Thank you so much for bearing with me. We still have a large audience that's still joining us. I know I'm probably right in front of dinner time. So let's open it up for any questions or we can take some questions. I know we have plenty of them in the Q&A. Um, let me take on one that's in there right now, which is, can someone get pre-approved with multiple lenders? And the answer is yes. So you're not um, you're not kind of stuck with one lender, so to speak. Uh, we would encourage you to get different options. Of course, we'd love to be your lender of choice, but you can certainly talk with other lenders for sure. All right. Um, we got that question. Let me make sure that I'm not missing anything in the chat. Let me just make sure I want to see if I'm missing anything. Um, one question was on how does student loans affect the credit score? So student loans are installment debt. So as long as those are paid on time, then you should have no negative impact to your credit score. Now, from an installment loan perspective, what I do see at times, so let's say I paid off a car loan, right? What there will be is probably initial decrease in the first couple months after you paid off the car loan. And, and then the score will bounce back after a couple months. But we tend to see that a little bit with installment loans. Okay. But but as long as you paid your student loan on time, there should be no negative impact. Okay. And yes, we will email out the presentation. So we got your question there. Absolutely. Um, okay. I think I'm good. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything. Any other questions from our group? Um, oh, I got I got a few more in the in the I, I got a couple more. Roberta, do I have time for two more? Okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, so question was these are these are a couple of good ones. So um, how do you choose the right lender for a first time home buyer? Um, is there any checklist that we we advise you to go through? So um, well, I, first of all, I think we're a really great lender as a first time buyer because we obviously focus on education in the process. Because most lenders, it's going to be here's your interest rate, here's your payment, go buy a house, right? 
So I think having a lender that's going to take the time to kind of walk you through the process, help educate you on your options, because not all lenders are approved, especially for first time buyer programs. So, I, you know, obviously I'm a little bit, a bit biased. I think we're an amazing choice for you, but certainly check out those options. I think knowing that they offer first time buyer programs, have experience with the process, I think is really important. Um, for the dream for all, there's a question there. So specifically, um, um, so let me, let me kind of read this question. So um, is there a waiver for the dream for all program specifically for parents home ownership if there's no relationship um, with your parents? So, um, so the, the, basically the rule is in place is that if your parents currently own, regardless of the relationship, if they currently own a home in the U S then you're not considered a first generational home buyer. So it's basically the qualifier is you have, you personally have not owned a house in the last seven years or have your name attached to any deed to a house. And then your parents have are not currently owners in the U S. Um, okay. All right. So another question was, can you qualify for um, products for homes if they're in a trust? And you absolutely can. So you can buy a home in a trust. Generally, most clients will buy a home in their individual names and then move up, move a property to a trust. Um, are there any mortgage products where you can choose to pay, uh, make payments biweekly versus monthly? Most products in this day and age, you can do things biweekly. Um, generally, the advantage to doing a biweekly payment is you're going to create one extra payment per year, which will generally take a 30-year fixed mortgage down to a 23-year payoff term. So, I mean, you could do that biweekly if that's more convenient for you from a payroll perspective. You can also accomplish the same thing on your own by um, paying one extra payment per year. Um, Okay. And then a question was, can you further discuss the tax benefits of the first home buying? So tax benefits, I would encourage you to talk to a tax advisor, but generally speaking, one of the benefits to owning a home is potential tax deductibility of interest. Everybody's tax situation is a little bit different. Everybody's at different tax levels or income levels, right? So I would encourage you to talk to a tax advisor about that. All right. Lots of great questions. And the, to follow up on the question about the extra payment one per year, most mortgages, every mortgage we offer, um, you can pay additional principal payments every every month if you want. So we would encourage you obviously to accelerate your payoff of your loan because we'd love for you to pay off your loan quicker. Um, so most loans, you should be able to prepay your loan. Every traditional loan that you've been shared with this evening in tonight's class has no prepayment penalties. So you can, you're encouraged to pay those off as quick as you can. And then I'll briefly explain refinancing. I think somebody just added, asked a question about that. So what refinancing means is, so when you refinance a home, you take your existing mortgage and you're trying to obtain generally a lower interest rate by taking that mortgage balance that you currently owe, transferring it to a new mortgage. There are costs that come along with refinancing. Usually it can be somewhere in the three to $4,000 range. You know, obviously over the last couple of years when interest rates are at the levels they are, not many people are refinancing right now, but as interest rates subside and get into lower levels, we'll probably see people refinance. Our general recommendation on refinancing is that you should lower your rate enough for you to be able to create at least $200 a month in savings to justify the cost of refinancing because that gets you about an 18-month break-even point. All right. Um, and question was, do we only work with alumni in California? So uh, no, we absolutely don't. We work with all clients. So I work with clients all across the country. So I'm licensed in multiple states. So, you know, we're, we're doing classes on the East Coast, in the South, Midwest, on the West Coast. So yeah, so if if you're uh, if you're anywhere you're at in the country, we're here to help serve you in a first time home ownership. Yeah. All right. Um, hey, Jason, one question. Quick, yeah. quick yeah, question. Yeah. Um, in the chat, if yeah. somebody doesn't currently live in California, are they able to qualify for California benefits? Um, if they're maybe moving back. Um, once they get residency here, well, let me let me kind of back up. So, for the Dream for All program, if you're interested in that, you have to be a current California resident. If you're moving back, you can partake in other first-time buyer programs, but. The dream for all has a lot of different stipulations to it. Um, and one of those is you have to be, one of the buyers has to be an existing California resident. 
Got it. Thank you. You're um, another welcome. one I saw in the chat. How do you determine um, if your home has equity? So, um, you know, obviously you can use Zillow or Redfin. I don't necessarily recommend those tools um, because they, they they can vary quite a bit in, you know, the valuation. Um you know, I would, you know, at times you can discuss that with a realtor. Uh, realtors can can do what they call as broker price opinion, where they can go out and kind of assess the value of your home. If you're thinking about refinancing because you're an existing homeowner, then an appraiser will come appraise your house um, to determine the value. Um, you know, it, it's kind of tough if you if you live in an area that there's not a lot of comparable sales, it can be tough to kind of pin that down. Um, but, you know, you can use some of the online tools if you do just want kind of a general estimate. Did I miss anything else in the chat? Let's I see. I think we're good on the chat, but there's two questions okay. in the Q&A. That's kind yeah. of the same thing about trusts. Yeah. So um, I think I answered this earlier, but on the trust side of things, you can qualify using a trust. We just need to have the trust um, documents to verify that it's a revocable trust. Um, so that, that is allowed. So most clients will pull the, the property depends on if they're first time buyers, they're going to buy the property in their individual names and then put that into their trust. It, it just makes the kind of the paperwork a little bit easier. Um, now the other question on trust is if my parents own a home in a trust, would I still qualify for first time buyer programs? So if your parents own a home in a trust, you would not qualify for the dream for all program but you still could be a first-time buyer program, sorry, first-time buyer for other programs that are available. Oh, this is, and this is a good follow-up question on refinancing. So I'm like we have more refinancing questions. This is great. So um, the question is, if you refinance, will the new appraisal amount affect your tax level um, or interest rate? So um, actually it was around interest rates, but let's talk about the taxes too. So it, depending on your equity position, that will affect your interest rate. So the more equity I have and the higher my credit score is, the better my interest rate could be for refinancing. So obviously the better value is, 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 is a much more improved option for you. Now, when you refinance, that does not impact your tax level for your property taxes. So a lot of people think because my house is assessed at 400,000, but it appraises for 700,000, that my taxes go up to 700,000. That isn't the case. You still remain at your assessed value. The only things that can change your assessment is transfer of ownership or capital improvements to your house um, or any type of, you know, kind of transfer of deed um, situation for any type of monetary value. All right. Good questions tonight. All right. I think we, I think we did it, Roberta. Yeah, I think that was everything, um, which was so impressive. I think we did almost 180 questions wow, um, okay. during tonight's session. So um, great job to you all. Um, and we will be sure to send the recording and the slides um, after, as we've mentioned multiple times. Um, Jason, I'm going to just take over the um, screen sharing so I can go over some quick yeah, absolutely. Um, you got it. announcements. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Big thank you to, of course, our, our APM partners, you, Jason and Ken, but also to all of you for taking the time to join us for tonight's workshop. We have some really great um, things coming up. And first, we would love for you to share your session um, feedback after tonight's call. Everybody will be entered into a drawing for an Amazon gift card or Apple AirPods. So you can scan the QR code on the screen. Um, and this really helps inform the Career Center of how we can better improve the Financial Literacy Conference. So make sure you do that. Also wanna plug our Young Alumni Summer Party. This year's event will be on Saturday, June 1st um, in downtown LA at a little place called Harbor House. And it's a really great way for you to meet other young alumni in the area to um, connect, meet, talk to graduates, but also our young alumni are technically up until the age of 35. So there's lots of folks that went non-traditional paths or are just reconnecting with the alumni association. So I hope you'll join us for that. And if you scan the QR code and share your, your email with us, we will send you a 10% discount code for when registration is live. So you can get a little deal on that. Also want to let you know if you're interested in getting involved in any of our volunteer board, whether it's one of our networks like the Alumni Real Estate Network or our Young Alumni Council, which hosts our first time homebuyer workshops, uh, you can apply to 
join these boards um, by May 9th. And um, it's a great way to, again, meet more people, but also get some professional development as well. So scan the QR code or use the tiny URL you see on the screen. Financial literacy conference will continue through tomorrow. And there's still quite a few options um, that are virtual, including a session about knowing your rights and your worth, mastering your credit score. So I did see some questions about, about how things will affect your credit score. They'll definitely talk about those tomorrow. There's gonna be a session on sustainability and impact investing along with side hustles tomorrow evening. And then if you're still looking for even more workshops on financial um, coaching and things like that, um, later this month on April 17th, our Young Alumni Council is hosting a workshop called The Art of Intentional Spending. An alumna and certified financial coach will be leading that. Um, so you can register at the tiny URL on the screen or the QR code. And that's it. So again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time coming and, and continuing that lifelong learning of how you can take this next step in on your journey of maybe buying a home. Um, so with that, you know, I always got to leave it. Bye on y'all. Bye on. Bye. Bye.